All right, so a few weeks ago, I don't remember exactly when, thank you, we started talking about the importance of the fall holidays that we can celebrate, and I say we should celebrate. We had Rosh Hashanah. Unfortunately, we didn't get taken up in the clouds on Rosh Hashanah. Then we had Yom Kippur, which is considered the most holy day of the year. That was a week ago yesterday. And if you people were holy, you would have fasted like Peyton did. I didn't, so I'm not claiming to be that. Parker did. Um, I'm going to shoot for it next year. We just had a wedding this year, and two key people were out of town for that wedding. So, well, you know, I knew trying to work a wedding and not eating, I'm justifying. Sorry. Anyway, now we are in the middle of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, as Monica remembered. I think that was Monica. Sukkot. Everybody say Sukkot. Feast of Tabernacles. It's a week-long thing that we're in the middle of. Started Wednesday night at sundown. Is that right, Peyton? And goes through this coming Wednesday night at sundown. Thursday. My bad. All right. So we talked about the first coming of Jesus coinciding with the first three spring feasts. You might be tired of hearing this, but I'm going to say it over and over because it keeps tying in. His death, burial, resurrection, bringing, coming of the Holy Spirit all tie exactly to the first four feasts. Then we had the summertime, which could be like the church age we're in now. And then we have these fall feasts, and we expect they will be fulfilled in order just like the spring feasts were. We talked... Peyton kind of mentioned it earlier, but Sukkot is all about joy. Yom Kippur was about atonement for your sins. That's not a good thing. Sukkot is not, what? Yeah, a goat getting thrown down a cliff. That's not a good thing. That's the scapegoat. Now we're in Sukkot, and that's supposed to be a time of joy. So we need to make sure everybody's got joy. Everybody's got smiles on their face. Everybody's laughing. That's why I try to make a few jokes this morning. Got a hee, hee, hee. Everybody say joy. joy. It's Pete's favorite word. I get it seven days a week, and I love it in text. Joy, joy, joy. It's the word of the day. He's always in Sukkot. <laughs> now, we talked about the second coming of Jesus being a series of events, most likely, not just one event. And that's where we've got to make sure we don't get tied to just looking for one event. We get stuck. Somebody says the rapture is the second coming. And somebody else says when he fights the final battle, the thousand-year reign, that's the second coming. And I would say they're both part of the second coming. I actually read this week a guy that said maybe we're all wrong. The second coming is the rapture, and there's a third coming. See, it's so hard for people to get their arms around. Why can't we just have one first coming that was 33 years and a second coming that exists of several other events? I don't know why that's so hard for people to get their arms around. So I've done my best to explain that second coming of Jesus, that it will probably be more than one event. I could be wrong, but it just makes sense. And we start building a timeline, and we talked about we believe the second coming will be marked by this event we call the rapture, the snatching up of believers. Paul talked about it in First and Second Thessalonians. If you missed that, if you don't remember, go back and listen to that. But we've got to discuss the events after the rapture because in case I'm wrong, <laughs> you need to know what to expect. And I think we need to be able to explain what we believe and what we think and what we see in Scripture to believers that don't understand. You don't have to be perfect, but we need to have some kind of basis. So by the end of the last teaching, we were building a timeline, and I realized that even in what I gave you on your sheet, I'm missing up one thing we threw in there. We got this great departure event, this snatched-up event. Where does it happen, Pete? Up in the air. Thank you. Harpazod was the Greek word. Rapturos, the Latin word, is where we get the word rapture, the Holy Spirit, the church is removed. Then we have the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist is revealed. But what I forgot to put in there is remember we talked about there has to be a temple that has to be rebuilt. So if people start telling you they see the Antichrist, they know that person's the Antichrist, be like, I don't know, there's no temple built yet. When the temple's being built or is built, then I'll start looking for that person. I think we'll be gone when he's revealed. Then we talked about the wrath being poured out in the tribulation and what wrath meant. That's what we spent a lot of time last time talking about, the great anguish, the wrath. 
that I think we're protected from. I hope we're protected from. I am an escapist. Admittedly, I want to escape God's wrath. If you don't, I gave you a word for that that I've been made fun of for a couple of weeks that Jeff forgot to cut out of the video. Then Jesus comes back to reign for a thousand years. We're going to get to this next week, but I think we get to reign with him. I thought I was going to do it this week. It's going to be next week. God keeps redirecting things. So as we build our timeline, we've got to make sure, and I will try to make sure that in our time left, we're going to get to all the events that have to happen. I want you to leave here knowing these are the things that have to happen. And if you forget, you'll have a reference. You can go back to your sheets. You can go back and find them online. Remember, all these documents are online. They're on our app. All you got to do is go to that week's sermon, whether it's the full service. Parker's making fun of me for throwing my hand around. Whether it's the sermon itself or the full service, you can download the documents. You can go back and listen to them. I think it's super important. But before we go farther on our timeline, I got to stop, clarify, and correct something I told you wrong two weeks ago. So to set the stage for what I said wrong, we were having a discussion based out of what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 7. I went ahead and put that back on this week's sheet of paper you have in front of you. Paul is talking about the Antichrist being revealed, and he says, and you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. In other words, God's in control of his timing, not us, not Satan. Verse 7, for this lawlessness is already at work secretly. We see it at work, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. So that's what we talked about. The Holy Spirit, the church, has to step out of the way so the Antichrist can be revealed. To me, that's the rapture. We're raptured out. We're out of the way. Now the, the Antichrist can be revealed. I don't think I said anything wrong about this part so far. It is the church. It is the Holy Spirit that is holding back. We, as the church, represent the age of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and we'll talk more about this today to make sure we're clear. But we also discussed that some non-believers will have the opportunity to become believers during the tribulation after the church is removed. And the question was asked, do you think the Holy Spirit will be present during the tribulation? To which I answered, no, I don't think so. And I believe that statement I said to you was very, very, very wrong. And I'm sorry. I'm going to spend some time today correcting it. And we're going to teach this correctly. So it's a little bit off the path, but apparently God wanted us to spend time. I'm not saying God had me say it wrong. That was my own free will and my own mouth getting ahead of my brain. But I want to come back to it and spend some time here because I think I answered that incorrectly, and I think that's very serious to get it correct. I was immediately convicted that that's one I should have said, you know what, you know, sometimes we need to be able to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. Let me get back to you. And normally I can be very good at that, but for some reason that day I just went ahead and spouted off what was on the top of my head. And immediately, as soon as the service was over, I was like, I don't think I answered that right. I need to go dig into that. Then we got home and Peyton was like, I don't think you answered that right. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know, I know. And here's what stinks. I know I didn't say it right, and it's going to be two weeks before I get to come correct it. So the Lord has worn me out for two weeks. Like, what great timing was that? Now, I did contact the person that asked the question and told them I was wrong. <laughs> and because I thought the person asking the question was most likely to remember the answer. So I need to make sure that person knows I misled them in case for some reason they didn't make it today. So first and foremost, I want to apologize for answering that off the cuff. Second, I want to correct scripturally what I said, because I do think the Holy Spirit will be present with believers in the tribulation. I'm going to say it again. The answer should have been yes. I do believe the Holy Spirit will be present with believers during the tribulation. Thank you, Pete. Pete likes this answer better. You're going to be gone. You'll be out. But for other people you may know (laughs) that didn't take it seriously, they will get the Holy Spirit. All right, I got to shut up. Here I go again with my mouth out running my brain. Anyway, I do believe the Holy Spirit will be present during the tribulation seven-year period. But before I explain the scriptures that make me believe that, we got to go backwards because I think it's important to understand how the Holy Spirit has existed on our earth with people from the beginning. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the entire Bible. I'm going to give you some examples. If we go backward, 
I'm going to kind of split this up into three time periods. One time period is before Pentecost. So you can't just say Old Testament because the beginning of the New Testament is before Pentecost. So I'm going to say before Pentecost. Okay, that's time period one. Then the day of Pentecost till present day is period two. And it's continuing. And then when a tribulation starts, I'm going to call that period three. Okay? So is that clear? Don't worry. There's no test on this. And I'm going to kind of go through it. Before the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost for the church, that's period one. The time of the church, the church age we're in now is time two. The tribulation is time three. Most of you will only be here for one of those time periods. <laughs> There's a joke there. Some of you may be around for the first one. Sorry, I won't go there. All right. Before Pentecost, before the day of the church age, God chose who he poured his spirit out on. We know in Genesis, early on, the spirit hovered. The spirit was present. But God chose who he poured out his spirit on. Not everybody got it. Not, you know, there were men of faith, but not everybody had faith, got the Holy Spirit. God chose who he poured out his spirit on. I want to give you an example. Because this example, you get both sides of it. God poured out his spirit and God took away his spirit. It's king Saul. Anybody remember King Saul? First king of Israel. The people of Israel were never supposed to have a king. The people demanded a king because that's what everybody else had. And God finally conceded and said, I'm going to give you this king. And God picked this man named Saul. He did it through Samuel. So Samuel, I'm not going to give you that scripture, but just please trust me on this. Samuel had had God's spirit poured out on him. And we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel 10. Samuel is anointing Saul as king. Saul has been chosen. Samuel is anointing him. He's anointing him as the man that God has chosen to rule Israel. And in verse 6, Samuel tells Saul, At that time the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person after these signs take place. Do what must be done, for God is with you. So Samuel, who has the Spirit poured into him, is telling Saul, there's going to come a time when you will have it. Saul doesn't have it at this moment. He's get, about to get it. And Samuel's saying, you're going to have it. Okay, verse 9 and 10, it says, As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart, and all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. This is when Saul gets the Spirit. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, They saw a group of prophets coming toward them. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy. So God decided to give his Spirit to Samuel. He decided to give his Holy Spirit to Saul. But then, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase and cut to the chase. Oh, Saul starts to get a little big-headed, like this is all about me. I'm the one doing all the good things. That's called pride, right? Saul starts to kind of think of himself as all-powerful instead of realizing and recognizing that God provided that power. He quits giving the Holy Spirit credit for leading him, making him a great leader, the chosen leader. So six chapters later in 1 Samuel 16, God takes away his spirit from Saul. I think there's a whole teaching in here that we could do, but I'm just trying to give you a little bit of back study to get to why I think I want to change the answer to my question or why I know I want to. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. So between these six chapters, Saul had basically come from the chosen one God poured his spirit unto to the, let's call the prideful one that God's removing his spirit from. It says, now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. That's a sobering statement. I know people that don't follow one command God gives them. They don't obey anything. They're saved by the grace of Jesus, and they want to know why they're tormented all the time. I'm like, this might be a clear indication right here. Again, that's a different sermon for a different day. But the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. So God gave his spirit to Saul. Then God took away his spirit from Saul. Does that make sense? There are many references throughout the Old Testament that I could give you where God chose who got the Spirit and who didn't, but I chose this one because we have a clear case of where God gave it and then God took it away. See, being filled with God's Holy Spirit, and I think the church of today needs to hear this, like the Holy Spirit-filled church that we're supposed to be, 
it doesn't mean that you become some perfect robot that does nothing wrong. You still have free will. You have the guidance and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but you still have free will. Saul had free will when he had the Spirit, and he still made bad choices, and God chose to remove that Spirit from him. I think that's very important to understand. We have to look at the presence of the Holy Spirit as being a privilege, something we take very serious that we have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, but we still have to make good, godly decisions and be obedient. Saul quit doing that, and now God takes the Holy Spirit away from him. Okay, the next guy in line is David. David was scared that the Holy Spirit was going to be taken from him. If we back up one verse from where the Spirit was taken from Saul, we back up one verse to verse 13, we see that David is given God's Spirit. So Samuel's been given his Spirit. Saul's been given his Spirit. Now David has been given his Spirit. It says, so as David stood there among his brothers, because remember, the, the back story of this is Samuel had gone to pick the next king because the Spirit was going to be removed from Saul. Samuel goes to pick, and Samuel goes through the brothers that look the part, and this is where God says, I don't choose them by their looks, I choose them by their heart. This may have made it into a book I wrote. It's important what our heart looks like, not what our outward appearance or what we say. It's what our heart, how we're willing to follow Jesus. And Samuel gets to David, and Samuel knows this is the one, but it's not the one that makes sense for anybody. Verse 13, so as David stood there amongst his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And we know from the story now Saul has a purpose to kill David because he's scared David's going to take his reign, which he does. Drive Saul crazy. But in Psalms 51... David writes this psalm, and this is a repentance psalm. This is when he has committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's done something very bad. He's filled with the Spirit. Now he does some battles, takes care of Goliath, becomes the king, and now he does something really dumb. And some of us do things that are really dumb. Like we have these good God experiences, and we do something really dumb. Any of you all ever done that? And we wish we hadn't have done it. That's where David is when he writes Psalm 51. He is in a moment of repentance. He's writing a repentance prayer to God. And I'm just going to go through verses 9 through 11. He says, don't keep looking at my sins. This is David talking to God. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. He's repentant. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew that the consequences of his actions might put him in a place where God, he knew he was anointed by God. He knew he had the Spirit of God. But David also knew you can take it away. And he took that seriously. So my question is, do we take that seriously? Do we take it seriously, what it means to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us? But see, in this example of Saul and David, God gives Saul the Spirit, and he takes it away. God gives David his Holy Spirit, and David is scared that God will take it away, but David is repentive. David is remorseful. David is crying out to God, and he's trying to make his mistakes right. And God allows his Spirit to remain on David. Again, I think this could be a completely separate sermon. Both men make mistakes. One man is repentive. One is not. The one with the right heart of repentance keeps the Holy Spirit. The one that has the wrong prideful heart loses the Holy Spirit. So again, this is in the Old Testament and before Pentecost, God chose who received the Holy Spirit. And he also chose who he took it away from. So that's time period one out of three, okay? Now after Pentecost and where we are now, and up until what I think will be a rapture, we're going to call that period two. I'm calling it the church age. It's very clear through Scripture that the Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. So that's the big difference. Before Pentecost, God chooses who gets the Holy Spirit. After Pentecost, every believer has the Holy Spirit living in them. Do we get how cool and privileged, much of a privilege that is? Sometimes when you have something just freely given to you, you take it for granted. And that's some of the conviction for me, even as I'm going through this, is do I seriously get it of how cool it is that God chose to give His Spirit freely to all of us that believe in His Son, Jesus? 
There are many scriptures that tell us this. I just picked a few, and I'm going to run through them quickly. Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God, this is Paul talking, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That's pretty cool. The Spirit of God that had the power to raise Jesus from the dead, that's a powerful spirit, lives in you. He didn't say lives in some of you that God chose. He said it lives in you. You're a believer. It lives, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? See, previous to Pentecost, there was a physical temple. The one we talked about has to be rebuilt for the Antichrist to come. And God's presence lived in that temple behind the curtain. That curtain was torn when Jesus died. The holiest of holies. Now, Jesus dies, resurrected, sin, says as the Holy Spirit, and we're told we're the temple. Each of us is the temple. The Holy Spirit dwells in each of us, and that's what we're learning here. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles. That pretty much covers everybody. You're either Jew or Gentile. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles. Some are slaves, some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. He didn't say Jews get the spirit differently than Gentiles, or Gentiles get more of it. This is where the replacement theology comes in today, where a lot of Christians want to say we as the church replace the Jewish people. No, we are grafted in, and Paul's clear. We get the same spirit, and we share the same spirit. Ephesians 1.13, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. So in each of these scriptures, we're seeing something. It's, it's, it's a very important. It's different. Before Pentecost, God chooses who gets the Spirit. There were faithful believers that followed God's commands, but they didn't necessarily mean they had the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, after Pentecost, we all get it. Yes. Okay. I'm already prepared to tell you I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> If they believe in Jesus, if they believe in Jesus, that's correct. If they believe in Jesus, this one I am sure of, if they believe in Jesus. <laughs> I'm not saying God can't pour his spirit out onto someone, but this is clearly talking about the time that believers have Jesus, or I'm sorry, have the Holy Spirit living in them. So this is where we are now. All of us that believe in Jesus have the Holy Spirit living in us, and that should be looked at as a great, great, great privilege. But don't miss out on some things as I go through this. It should also produce a changed person. It should also produce a changed heart. And it doesn't happen immediately. It can. You believe in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit, then you go through this process, this fancy work called sanctification. That means you're trying to get closer to Jesus. It's taken me 20, 25 years of dedicated trying to have a change in my heart. So this isn't, and I've heard miracles of where people are changed immediately, and that's awesome. But for most of us, it is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. But we should be able to look back 20 years later and say, I'm not that person. And if you can't, you may need to do some work, okay? Supposed to produce a changed person, a changed heart. But just like Saul and just like David, we are flawed human beings, and we continue to sin. And sometimes we don't even know we've sinned. That's the beauty of the blood of Jesus, to cover those sins. So again, I'm trying to make the point out that the Holy Spirit doesn't make you perfect. I know I've gone to church with people, and they can get up and speak in tongues all day long and interpret your tongues and dance around, and then they go to work on Monday and cheat everyone they're, walking, they're around. 
So there's a question there. Is that truly the Holy Spirit working in them in that moment on that Sunday church service? Because there's more about the Holy Spirit changing who you are, convicting you, making you come into more alignment with Christ and his commands than there is about jumping around, hooping and hollering and speaking in tongues. Paul is pretty clear about that, too. So that's my concern is that we all have the Holy Spirit living in us, but do we even understand that? Do we take it seriously? When we get that conviction, are we willing to change? It was conviction that led me to this whole sermon today. But have I always been good at listening to that conviction? No. Am I always good at listening to it now? Sometimes. It's a process, right? The Holy Spirit steers us to repentance, steers us to change if we drop our pride and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. When it comes to this question, I made a mistake. I'm not trying to stand up here and beat myself up. I'm just trying to be vulnerable and honest. I didn't convict myself. The Holy Spirit convicted me. Now what do I do with it? What do I do with this conviction? See, pride would say, Jason, just move on and act like it didn't happen. Nobody will remember what you said two weeks ago anyway. And I could have done that. And it would have just passed over. Right? Simple mistake. It ain't worth dealing with. It's so small. But the Holy Spirit's conviction hasn't allowed me to, like, take a breath away from it for two weeks. So I kind of knew, like, I put a thing in my calendar this morning at 9 a.m. with a one-hour reminder to make sure that I somehow address this because it's worn me out. So at that point, I can't just move on. I don't really care if you see the flaw. I care that you see the repentance and the change. And I care that you see that I'm trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm sort of like David right now in a different way. I didn't do the sin David did, but I'm about to tell you in a minute, the sin I think I committed was pretty strong. So I'm kind of like David right now. God, please don't take your spirit from me. Please don't take your presence from me. So we've addressed the time period before Jesus, before Pentecost, I should say. We've addressed our current state of being a Jesus believer. That's time period two. So now with that background, we finally get to the question, to the future during the tribulation. Period three, is the Holy Spirit present during the tribulation? Here's what I should have said. <laughs> Here's how I should have answered that question. In 2 Thessalonians, it is clear that the Holy Spirit is working through the church to restrain complete evil. There's evil going on. But we're told evil is going to happen, and we're going to see that. But it's very clear in 2 Thessalonians that the Holy Spirit is working through the church to restrain complete evil, to restrain the Antichrist. But when the rapture happens, the Holy Spirit will no longer hold back the lawlessness that will hit our world. Just because the Holy Spirit is not restraining the evil does not mean he is completely gone and out. Do you see the difference there? He's the restrainer. I wasn't wrong about that. He allows the Antichrist to come on the scene. It doesn't mean he's not present. It doesn't mean he's completely zipped out of here. That was the mistake I made. I actually do believe after, I mean, immediately I thought of a scripture in John. I didn't know exactly where it was. We're going to go over here in a second. But pretty much immediately I knew I had the wrong answer. But studying it, I know I was wrong. Because I do believe the Holy Spirit will be present on the earth during the tribulation period. If I get asked this question again, I hope I will answer it this way. <laughs> yes, absolutely, I believe the Holy Spirit will be present during the tribulation. But the Holy Spirit will not be restraining evil. Here's a few scriptures. John 3, 5 through 8. This is when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Jesus has just laid out something Nicodemus can't get his arms around. you got to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about, Jesus? i got to go back into my mom's womb and be born again. I'm an old man. This doesn't make sense to be born again. And this is Jesus explaining to him. Jesus, starting in verse 5, Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Born of water. You're inside your mother's womb. You're in water. You're born of water. 
And he says, and the spirit. Humans can, produ- can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. What's the point? Jesus makes it very clear to be born again, the Holy Spirit has to be there and doing the work. Okay? The blood of Jesus is what provides it. The power of the Holy Spirit is what allows us to be born again. So the Holy Spirit's presence has to be there if someone wants to go from non-believer to believer. Okay? In Revelation 7, 4, John says these words, and he's repeating what Jesus told him. Then he, he is Jesus, then he, Jesus said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. So in the great tribulation, Jesus is clearly saying right here, there will be people that will become believers. There will be people in this world, in the church, that say no one can be saved in the tribulation. Point them to Revelation 7, 14. It's actually pretty prominent out there that if you don't get saved before tribulation, you're done. Jesus says right here, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So they've clearly become saved in the great tribulation. It won't be good times, Wendy said. Let's remember that. So remember, I'm an escapist. I want to be out of here. But there's going to be some endurance. <laughs> they're going to be here. They're going to get persecuted. But they're going to give their life to Jesus. And if I take Revelation 7 and I take John 3 and I put them together, if people are going to be saved in the Great Tribulation, that means the Holy Spirit has to be present in the Great Tribulation. That's where I was wrong in the answer. I'm going to say it again just to make sure. In the Great Tribulation, Jesus says there will be people that will become believers washed in his blood. John 3, Jesus says that salvation involves the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit has to be present during the tribulation for people to become believers. That's as clear as day, and I'm sorry I answered that incorrectly, but I think it's important that we understand What's going to happen? Now, what is not clear? Because, of course, this can't just be totally black and white. (laughs) What is not completely clear is, does the Holy Spirit's presence happen like it did pre-Pentecost? Or like it's happening now in the church age? We don't really have that answer. In other words, does God choose who gets it during the tribulation and gets saved? Or is everyone still going to have free will to make that decision and the Holy Spirit's available to anyone? I don't know. That is not defined. But I think there's some words that are comforting that Jesus said in John 3, paraphrasing, you're not going to understand all this. It's actually very prideful if we think we're going to understand all this. That's why I've tried to say, here's my view of what Scripture says about a rapture. If I'm wrong, you need to know what's next in case I'm wrong. I very, think it's very clear there is one, but we need to know the next pieces in case I'm wrong. We don't have to know everything. Jesus said, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. We cannot explain it. We can understand the history that God chose to give it and take it away. We can understand the history of the current age that we get it as believers. That's through Scripture. We don't have to understand it all. How does the Spirit do it? Jesus himself says, so you cannot explain how people are born of the Spirit. So we've got to get our arms around. We don't have to explain everything. We could say, I don't know. It's a mystery. Paul talks about mysteries. He talks about that when he's talking about husbands and wives. He talks about in Ephesians 5 that a husband and wife coming together in marriage represents Jesus coming back for his church. And he says it's a great mystery. He doesn't explain it all. He just says it's comparable and it's a great mystery. So when a husband and wife celebrate a 20-year anniversary, for example, we're celebrating Jesus coming back for his church. That's a cool fact, but I can't explain what that looks like. It's a great mystery, and that's what we have here. But the important thing that I clear up is that the Holy Spirit will definitely be part of the tribulation. I try to say it like a hundred times to make sure I have fixed my problem. (laughs) I don't think we'll be here because if we're not, 
removed, I don't understand anything that Paul's talking about in 2 Thessalonians. It doesn't make sense. When he says, until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way, when, he, when you combine that with all the other scripture, it makes no sense to me. If we're not raptured, I got a bigger mystery than I thought I had. And that's okay, too. If I see a temple being built, and I see a man stand in it and call himself the Antichrist, and he does a peace agreement, I'm going to probably hopefully drop my pride again and go, I missed something. Now buckle up. It's going to get bad. But at least the Holy Spirit's presence will still be there with us, right? Either scenario, we're raptured, we're out of here, or not, the Holy Spirit will be present in the tribulation because people are washed by the blood of Jesus in the tribulation. And Jesus let us off the hook when he said, you can't explain it all. You don't have to understand it all. But I do think we need to study it. Just because Jesus says you, don't, you won't understand it all doesn't mean we just need to bury our heads in the sand and not even try. We need to study it. We, want, we need to yearn to know more about our Savior and more about our Father and more about His Spirit's presence. I've learned something through this. We need to be digging in continually. But then we need to rest in those areas that we can't figure out. Let's dig in. Let's be excited to know more. But then when we just can't figure something out and somebody can't even help us, just, just rest. It's okay. It's okay. Now, i got one more scripture on this. I knew this was going to take a while, so this is why I'm not going to go forward on the Antichrist and all that till next week. But in Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel is given, has been given a prophecy about what's going to happen before Jesus returns to rule over Israel. So this happens up to and during the tribulation period, so to speak. It's a messianic prophecy. It means it's a prophecy about Jesus. Ezekiel 36, 24 through 38, For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Let's stop right there. That is happening right now. In 1948, Israel became a nation. I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm just going to make this up. If there were like a million Jews living in Israel in 1948, there were, what, 10, 11, 12 million living in the rest of the world. Just in the past couple of months, we've ca crossed a threshold where now more Jews live in Israel than the rest of the world combined. We are watching the gathering of the nations being brought, the people, the Jews being brought back. That's why it's dangerous when these conspiracy Q people start talking about they're not the right Jews, they're the Rothschild Jews. Get that garbage out. They are Jews, they are God's chosen people, and we better get behind supporting them. I don't know if you're aware of this. Wendy talked about Netanyahu's house getting hit yesterday. Guess what else happened yesterday? Netanyahu, the Israeli the IDF, trusted the United States with their attack plans back on Iran, and what did the U.S. do? They leaked it yesterday. Now, hopefully he was smart enough to give them a fake plan knowing they would leak it. But my point is, we need to support Israel no matter what our country does and no matter what other Christians say around us. If you've got a Christian that comes up to you and says, those aren't the right Jews, politely excuse yourself from the conversation and just get away from them. I've tried to argue with them. It doesn't go well. <laughs> Call me, Peyton, and I'll go argue with them. You're off the hook. My point is, we're watching this happen. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. That's a promise. It's a messianic prophecy, and it's happening now. He doesn't say how long it's going to take. <laughs> he doesn't say if it's going to take 100 years, 40 years, 70. Well, obviously more than 40. But he doesn't tell you how long it's going to be. But that's not the important part. The important part, verse 25, it says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away. Remember, he's talking about the Jewish people that have not received Jesus as Messiah. And you will no longer worship idols, and I will give you a new heart. Doesn't that sound like what God said to Samuel, I mean to uh, Saul? And you will no longer, I'm sorry, I'm out of whack here. I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. This is exactly what he told Samuel, or Saul, sorry. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations, and you will live in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people, and I will be your God. So we know through this 
that before Jesus can rule and reign for a thousand years, and we're going to get to that eventually, I keep promising it every week, we're going to get there, God says he will put his spirit in his people so they will believe in Jesus as the Messiah. This has to be fulfilled. This is a messianic prophecy about the Jewish people accepting Jesus, coming back, and God will put his spirit in them. It can only be done when God puts his spirit in them. So once again, I think it's, we have to know that the Holy Spirit's presence is going to be here through the end. Because this is going to happen, it's happening now, and it's going to continue up to that final battle. So I spent a lot of time on this today. But I think it's a crucial thing to understand. Simple question, thank you for asking. And I made a mistake. Simple mistake, right? But it forced us to dig deeper into understanding the Holy Spirit's presence and how important the Holy Spirit is. I am sorry that I misspoke, and I very much thank God for putting His Spirit in me to convict me to revisit this and correct it. But I need to tell you why I think it's important that I would stand here and correct it in front of you. As I told you guys when we covered James, if you remember that many, many months ago, as a teacher, I will be judged at a higher standard than you based on what I teach you and based on how I live it out. We're also told in Scripture there's one unforgivable sin. Anybody remember what that is? Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So it has concerned me over the past two weeks that me saying the Holy Spirit won't be there in the tribulation is a little bit like blasphemy. <laughs> so I'm Psalms 51 or whatever that was. Lord, please don't take your spirit from me. <laughs> that was not my intention. I don't think that's what it means by blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but I'm a little concerned. I was getting like right there on the edge. I don't want to stand in judgment for teaching incorrectly, and I certainly don't want to be denied eternity with Jesus because I blasphemed the Holy Spirit, even if it was an accident. The one Spirit that unites us all and brings us to salvation. The one Spirit that makes our belief in Jesus possible. Again, I'm going to say it again. My concern, the question was, did I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Maybe denying the power of the Holy Spirit his involvement in salvation, knowing it's clearly there, is blasphemy. But being convicted, being humbled, and correcting it with Scripture of what I answered wrong, I don't think that's blasphemy. So I ask for God for his forgiveness in making a pretty big mistake that may have seemed very minor that we could have glossed over. But if we can't admit that we're wrong, aren't we falling right into the same place Saul was with pride? So that's where I'm going to end today. I didn't intend to talk about the Holy Spirit's presence during the end times discussion, but apparently the Holy Spirit wanted us to. <laughs> so next week, we're going to pick back up on the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and another important event in the second coming of Jesus. Next week, we're going to finally get to some things I promised that we're going to get to. Unless I listen to today and realize I said something wrong again. <laughs> but in all seriousness, our time is short. I don't mean just how many Sundays we have left. I'm talking about our time is short. We need to be making sure we take all this seriously. We need to make sure that we understand and that when we're wrong, we have the courage to stand up and say I'm wrong. If there's nothing else I can teach you, I'm trying to model things. So this isn't a pat me on the back as saying, do you live in enough fear of God that you would sit and say, did my words blaspheme the Holy Spirit? I don't want to live in this, fe this fear from Satan that says I'm not good enough and rejection. I want to live in the fear of God that I take time to correct what was wrong. And that's an example I hope this set for you. Father, thank you first and foremost for giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. I um, guess first and foremost for your son, Jesus and for seeing us fit to be grafted into that family. But thank you for the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us to repentance, that brings us to salvation, that is the only way we can go after, I guess is the best way for me to say it, the blood of Jesus. It can't happen without your Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand here today and correct a wrong, to point out the importance of your Spirit, to be thankful for your Spirit, 
And, Father, I pray that everyone in this room will be filled with so much of your spirit that people who haven't seen us in five years wouldn't even recognize us. They would say, this is a changed person. This person has a changed heart. Because sometimes those changes happen so slowly we don't see it. But others from our past see it. And, Father, that's what I'm praying for, that we would allow your spirit to convict us, to change us, to humble us, to save us. And, Father, I thank you for your word that's clear, that when the conviction happens, we can go to your word, and you love us so much you gave us your word, that we can go to your word and understand it. But I also thank you for the mysteries, the things you don't want us to understand, the things that we will only understand later with you. And, Father, again, I just thank you for an opportunity to worship with these people. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord, may the Lord bless and keep you. May his grace and his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. This is 